every year during the month of Muharram, detailed historical accounts of the tragedy of Hussein ibn Ali's martyrdom on the plain of Karbala are recited from pulpits at gatherings across the Muslim world. But what are the origins of those historical accounts? Who are the compilers of Islamic history as we know it today? And what were their motives for the accounts that they gave? In this program, I'll be investigating what we can learn about Hussein ibn Ali from the sources. I am going to be interviewing Dr. Abdul Sheikh, teaching fellow in Islamic studies at the University of Leeds, who specializes in Middle Eastern and Islamic history and civilization, and asking how Hussein ibn Ali is depicted in early accounts of Islam's history. Assalamualaikum, uh, Dr. Abdul Sheikh. Thank you very much for giving us your time for this interview. Uh, we're here uh, in Leeds, and you're a lecturer at the University of Leeds. And I wanted to again thank you for your, for your time. Uh, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to take part in this great uh, venture. Um, you've specialised in um, particularly the medieval period of of history, of religious history, Jewish, Christian, uh, Muslim history. Um, which inshallah we'll touch on. Um, but I just wanted to go back um, a little bit earlier in history. And as has been said by certain historians, there's not a lot of information on the life of Imam Hussein salam, from the time that he was a child up until the coming of the events of Karbala. Do you have any view on why that might be, why we have this gap in his life? Um, I think it's probably more to do with the, the historical context and the setting uh, of that period uh, in time. Obviously the Ahlul Bayt is very much revered by all Muslims yeah. uh, around the world, but because of the, uh, the rivalries, the, the establishment of dynasties, that the Umayyad uh, dynasty, uh, because you know, there is this common saying that uh, the, the victors always write history because the Umayyad Empire was quite dominant once it was uh, established. It, it probably was more of a tendency to promote the credentials of Muawiyah the first and Yazid at the expense of Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein. And also, um, just moving on to uh, the issue with um, Muawiyah selecting Yazid as his successor. So there had been this agreement between um, Imam Hassan and Muawiyah, they had signed this agreement and part of that agreement was that um, Muawiyah would not select Yazid a as his successor and implicitly would hand back um, power to uh, the family of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his holy progeny. Um, but we see that once Imam Hassan had died and he died before Muawiyah did, um, then we see Muawiyah passing on the, you know, the successorship to his son Yazid. Uh, what, what were the reasons for that? I think uh, Muawiyah, uh, he knew that the Ahlul Bayt, you know, was a major, inst major institution, yeah. and the the figures, the personalities within the Ahlul Bayt are very much, you know, well. Um, revered, obviously there was a schism between Muawiyah and, uh, and Ali uh, so ultimately what you have is I think Muawiyah from my perspective probably was torn that he knew he always he told Yazid not to basically seek allegiance from Imam Hussein because it was, it was not a good idea but I think Yazid uh, there is, there is a lot of conjecture and yeah. a lot of discussion over the personality of Yazid, but ultimately power um, does strange things to different uh, people. So again, uh, you know, one is trying to you know fight against uh, ego, uh, nepotism, uh, potentially egotism, and, and and corruption. So ultimately, power does strange things to different people. Yeah. So I think Yazid, even though he actually went against uh, Muawiyah's. Uh, wishes and I think it was due to this sense that I'm the ruler I, I've been given power I will ask Imam Hussein to basically give me allegiance when in fact it wasn't a very um, good idea so I think ultimately with also with the Umayyad Empire it became more or less a dynasty mm -hmm. rather than a theocracy where you have 
um, father passing down power to the son. Of course, we, we also see around that time the fact that, okay, Yazid came into, came into power and he did, although, I mean, we know he was violent and, and um, coercing people to uh, give their allegiance, nevertheless, there is this issue of the fact that um, people did acknowledge him or they did follow him. I think ultimately, if you look at, um, if you look at the situation from a historical perspective, what you find is the Umayyads were very much organized in terms of how to basically run a state, yeah. that they had developed the infrastructures of, of power, they had a powerful army, powerful navy, so ultimately they had the infrastructure in terms of how they could maintain control and, and coincidentally during the Umayyad period, within 125 years, the, the, the empire had expanded all the way to, to, to Spain from the humble beginnings of the Islamic State in, uh, in Medina. So the Umayyads were very, very uh, clever and also what assisted them in terms of building their, their power, power and control base and having authority is they learned from other civilizations such as the, 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 the Byzantine Empire and also the Sassanids in terms of how to create the state. Because if you look at early Islam, you have a very micro, you have a micro state in Medina during the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Medinan constitution. Uh, so ultimately the Umayyads were very clever that they actually built the infrastructures by learning of other civilizations and that allowed Yazid to basically tap into the, the power and the might that actually been built up right. very, very uh, quickly. So I think military might uh, allowed Yazid mm -hmm. uh, to basically uh, fulfill his um, ambitions. Mm -hmm. Um, and also thinking about um, the whole the whole events of of, of Karbala, um, I mean, large parts of the Muslim world today are still quite unaware of what happened at Karbala, or they're unaware of you know who Hussein ibn Ali um, is. Um, do you think there are particular reasons as to why large parts of the Muslim world? Um, have been left unaware of that um, or you know are there moves um, going on in different parts of the Muslim world to try to raise that awareness or is it still do you feel quite a controversial uh, event that you know I think it, it's one the reason why Hussein ibn Ali is not given as much importance as he should be one due to the entrenchment due to the emergence and the entrenchment of Sunnism and you know I'm a firm believer that it's always the the victors that always write history and it's no surprise to find that the Umayyad Empire was the first civilization so ultimately they would have dictated how history was actually mm -hmm. written so obviously the Umayyads were in conflict with the, the, the family of Ahlul Bayt so it's no surprise to see that history, uh, the Umayyad history has so much glossed over mm -hmm. um, the you know the, the 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 life and the personalities of the imams, including Imam Hassan and and, and Imam Hussein, and that's probably one of the reasons why it's not given the actual events of Karbala and the life of Imam Hussein ibn Ali is not given as much attention, uh, attach, uh, attention, affection, and uh, import, importance mm -hmm. as a result of the people who are actually writing history. Because again, canonization um, is another important aspect we actually need. To, to talk about that history is presented in, in certain way and and, is, and, pe and people are expected just to accept one version yeah. of events or one historical uh, narrative whereas the the avid reader or the uh, the researcher will actually look at different views in terms of establishing what actually happened what were the events uh, that led to the to, led to the martyrdom of Hussein ibn Ali uh, what were the significance what were the ramifications um, of those particular events and, and, and unfortunately it has been glossed over mm -hmm. uh, by the Umayyads but it's not surprising because they wouldn't want to present history in a yeah. way that shows them in a negative light and I think that's one of the reasons why many Muslims are not aware of the, of the personality of Hussein ibn Ali. Okay, thank you very much Dr. Abdul Sheikh and uh, inshallah we hope that uh, we'll see you again yeah. in uh, future programmes. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to, to take part in this uh, dialogue. Mm -hmm. It can be seen that while undoubtedly Hussein ibn Ali is considered a significant figure in the Muslim world, the way in which he is remembered differs 
owing to historical accounts being advanced by those who seized the reins of power. I will be going to meet Professor Hugh Kennedy from the Department of the Languages and Cultures of the Near and Middle East at the School of Oriental and African Studies, London University. His books include titles such as The Great Arab Conquests, How the Spread of Islam Changed the World We Live In, and The Armies of the Caliphs, Military and Society in the Early Islamic State. Thank you very much, Professor Kennedy, for agreeing to give us this interview. Um, and I was going to start with the first question that's really based on your research, which is, in your view, uh, with regard to the Arab expansion after the death of the Prophet, did the tragedy of Karbala play any significant role or have any particular impact on that expansion? The uh, tragedy at Karbala, of course, has a political dimension to it, which is well recorded in all, all the chronicles. And it's a major political event, but it also has a, a equally important uh, equal importance in the discussion of the development of uh, the the memory of Hussein, the way the memory of Hussein and his death becomes so important to the Shi, the proto Shi, the emerging Shi community in Iraq. So it works at two levels: that there's, a, as it were, the political level, but also the religious and emotional level that, that, that this event caused, and so on. Uh, what it does affect, of course, is people's attitudes to Umayyad rule, mm -hmm. and it consolidates that opposition to Umayyad rule that, that emerged in Iraq in the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib and his caliphate and so on, and the way that the people of Iraq were resistant to Umayyad rule, really because as much as anything else it was Syrian rule. And you get from very early on in Islamic history this uh, rivalry, if you like, between this, the Muslims of Iraq and the Muslims of Syria. Mm -hmm. So, and of course the house of, of, of the Prophet, the house of Ali, is connected very early on with, with the Iraqis and the Iraqi side from the time that Ali was caliph. And, and so the, uh, Hussein's arrival in, in, in Iraq and his death is, is simply part of that story. In your view, how were the ethics and vision of Islam modified to accommodate an expanding military and economic power? I think that, that in the first century of Islam, people were really debating and in some cases struggling with the idea of how do you reconcile the simple ethics of, of of uh, the Islamic religion and, and Quran and, and the beginnings of Sunnah and so on, with the uh, complexities of running what was, by the standards of the time, a very advanced state. It has a, a taxation system, an administration, it mints money, it pays salaries, it has all the makings of a state which are things which were completely lost in Western Europe at the time. And there, there is a tension between uh, these, these two things, I think, and, and, and some of that is expressed in the reaction to Hussein's death, which is in some ways a reaction to this growing power of the state, the growing power of the bureaucracy and things like that. But it's something worth remembering, I think, that uh, the reverence or the respect for the House of Ali and the House of the Prophet was something that wasn't just confined to a small Shi group or proto Shi group, but was widespread. And accounts in Sunni historians of the death of Hussein um, and Tabarith, for example, Great History of the Prophets and Kings, which is the text we really rely on more than any other. Mm -hmm. the, the death of Hussein is considered as a, as a tragedy, um, partly because he, he, was, in fact, because he was the grandson of the Prophet and he'd known the Prophet well. The Prophet had you know, famously been very fond of his grandsons. And so it's, it's not a, a strictly, you're not one thing or the other mm -hmm. necessarily. The, the, as I said, the respect for the family of the Prophet stretches throughout, all through the Muslim community. How do you feel that Karbala has been depicted in historical texts on Islamic history? Well, you do get a, a divergence of historical texts, and particularly from the 10th century onwards, and you get a whole, um, as it were, the whole tragedy of Karbala is developed in predominantly in Shi'i texts, yeah. in a way that it isn't in, 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 in Sunni texts, particularly the tales of the suffering of uh, Hussein and his family. And there is this whole real live issue of the, the repentance, the Tawabun in Kufa. Mm -hmm. Remember that Hussein had been invited to come from Medina, 
where he was safely living, to Iraq by the people of Kufa in order to assume the rule and, and, and they would support him against the Umayyads and so on. And when he gets there, the people of Kufa do nothing. They don't come and help him. And this is a major element in the development of the whole tragic narrative. They said they were going to and they don't. And then when the tragedies happened, when Hussein is dead uh, and so on, then there was a widespread movement of really sort of shame amongst the people of Kufa that they hadn't come out and, and, and welcomed and rescued uh, the grandson of the prophet and so on. So you get immediately there is a strong emotional element here right from the beginning and these people, uh, the people of Kufa in a sense mobilize and they come out and fight the Umayyads and it's all it, it's more an emotional commitment right. than anything else and it turns out to be militarily futile because mm -hmm. the Umayyads are just better organized and, right. Right. And, and so on. So it's a classic example of the struggle of the of, of the holy man and his disciples against political and military power. Next stop is to meet Professor Sajjad Rizvi, director of the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter, to ask him about the nature and range of sources that are available by means of which we can grasp a better knowledge of the history of Hussein ibn Ali's life. Thank you very much, Professor Sajjad Rizvi, for giving us your time um, to talk about how we can approach the person of Imam Hussein salam, in the sources. Um, I wanted to ask, first of all, what can we gather um, about the life of Imam Hussein salam, from the early sources before the events of Karbala? I think it depends on what you mean by the early sources and which ones you're looking at. Um, there's, of course, a fair amount of uh, uh, material in the Shi sources on three areas of his life. Um, of course, there is his early life from his birth up to the uh, demise of the Prophet and uh, of his mother, of course. Yeah. Uh, so the early life of being part of, I guess, what you might call a holy family. Mm -hmm. uh, then there is a short period under the, the rule of his father, Amir al-Mu'minin. Uh, and then, to a large extent, it uh, jumps to the events at Karbala. But usually, when you look at the Shi'a sources, uh, the whole of the life of the Imam is about a sort of a teleological progression towards um, Karbala. Right. And Karbala, in a sense, is the, the culmination of his life. It's, it's the purpose of his life. And that's very clear when you look at some of the early sources, which uh, mention his birth. And you know the prophets um, grieving at his birth, yeah. uh, you know being told by Gabriel about the martyrdom, uh, having the earth of Karbala, you know presented to him, which he then presents to his wife Um Selma. Okay, thank you. And w what are the differences? What can we detect about the differences in the way that Imam Hussein alayhi salam is presented? Um, in the Sunni sources and, and the Shi'i sources, can we detect any, any differences there? I, mean, I think, um, of course, you have the commonalities, you know, being a beloved grandson of the Prophet, um, being a respected person, you know, of his family and of his time. So that doesn't change whether it's in Medina, whether it's in Kufa and other places. Yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, you do have Sunni sources which do mention uh, the letters which were written to him from Kufa, inviting him to take, to basically to to rebel against um, uh, Yazid or to reject the uh, allegiance of Yazid and pledging their allegiance to him, um, that's all there in the sources because of his prominence. Um, but then, of course, you get other things which come up in the Sunni sources, which um, I think there's an element of uh, trying to humanize someone, or perhaps a more cynical person would be to normalizing right. um, his status. And that's about, you know, his relationship with his wives and so forth. And, and you find those sorts of reports do come up about, um, you know, those who the Shi tradition calls imams in a way to show that they were just ordinary human beings. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very with much failings with failings and shortcomings and, and passions like anger and love and um, sort of intense feelings which uh, certainly don't fit within a straightforward um, Shi'id theological perspective of who the Imam should be.
I mean, with regard to how Imam Hussein Salam is portrayed in the Masaib um, and the narratives of, of the Masaib, how far does that go go back? Is that based on, say, a, a, a chain that might go, a chain of, we could say, not narration, but a tradition that goes back to the early period, or was that developed later? Well, I mean, we do have uh, maqatil literature, which is quite early. Yeah. Um, and of course, famously, you have Abu Mikhnaf, who is a Kufan tradent, um, whose work is extant in, in Tabari and other sources. And that gives you already a fairly clear account of what happened, uh, often in exactly the same order as we have in much later maqatil. Uh, but there's not much detail. And there's not much detail, quite simply, because in most early sources you don't have very much detail. Um, interestingly, of course, you do have some poetry, the, the rajas, which would have been recited you know, by fighters in battles. Um, some of that material is very early. Um, and we know that from other sources, uh, for example, on the Battle of Safin um, or on Jamal, where you have poetry uh, from that period. You, of course, have poetry from the battles during the time of the Prophet, which are also um, extant uh, in the biographies of the Prophet, such as the um, Ibn Hisham, the, the life uh, by Ibn Hisham. Uh, so that sort of material is already there. Of course, what we now know in terms of the, uh, the recounting of what happened at Karbala, uh, that, broadly speaking, uh, follows a structure which is much later. Mm -hmm. um, that's predominantly 15th, 16th century, uh, goes back to Kashafi's Razat al Shahada, and of course, as we know, Kashafi was not a, a Shi figure, mm -hmm. he was a Sunni figure. So, that uh, narrative, which is a Persian narrative, which, if, which influenced the Persianate world, which was both Sunni and Shi from that period onwards, um, that's the one which is dominant. And what then happens is the later uh, maqatil, uh, which we have, which are popular, which uh, then manifest themselves in actual majalis that people listen to and, and see and uh, hear, um, those uh, works are then based on Kashafi's account. Um, and another point with, of course, with, I suppose, our concern is letting people know about, you know, the mission of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. This comes around every year, there's this concern for letting people know about him. And I've had my personal experiences as well of being at interfaith gatherings or, or telling non-Muslims about him and about Karbala. And every time they have responded with a kind of astonishment that they didn't know about it before and that they've never heard about it. Uh, and, and consternation because they're saying, well, this is an important event and I know many Muslims and I've never heard about this from them. We've also got this issue with obviously how the history of Islam has, has always been written and it's been said the last few years that even non-Muslim writers of Islamic history tend to present that history from the perspective of uh, the victors or the you know the the apparent victors we could say uh, so there is this talk of a revisionist approach to to early islam what is this revisionist approach what's going on with this well before i get to that let me just say something about um, the writing of the history first mm -hmm. um, i mean certainly uh, most islamic history if we're talking about the primary sources yeah. is written from the perspective of a triumphalist imperial Islam. Yeah. And that triumphalist imperial Islam is very much about the Umayyads and the Abbasids. It's about power, it's about sort of the, the general narrative of uh, imperial rule, imperial ideology, enforcing the law, um, having the power to enforce your will, right? And within that, um, there's actually very little um, space for principles. There's very little space for principle action. There's certainly very little space for uh, what is material loss. Yeah. Um, and there is a very willful requirement to deal with the trauma of civil war. And the way you deal with the trauma of the early civil wars is, broadly speaking, you brush it away. Um, you know, you don't ask the question of why was Imam Hussein killed? Um, who was responsible for it, and even if you do want to engage in that, you want to try and uh, 
minimize um, the responsibility coming back to the caliphal yeah. center because the the broad strokes of that imperial Islamic historiography is to exonerate the caliph mm. uh, and to protect caliphal power. Um, so Yazid ultimately cannot be responsible. Now, of course, that's not the way the devotional literature works and never has worked, but certainly the broad uh, sort of brushes of imperial is Islamic history work in that way. And that, to a large extent, has also then impacted upon more recent academic work, uh, certainly in the last uh, century or so, which accepts those accounts and tends to uh, look at uh, sort of Shi'i counter-narratives as basically sectarian literature. Yeah. Um, it is uh, so the, the broad brushstrokes of, say, Tabari constitutes history, um, the broad uh, brushstrokes of, uh, say, Mufid, etc., constitute um, mere uh, political theology or rhetoric. The fact of the matter is, or propaganda in fact, yeah. The fact of the matter is all of this stuff is rhetorical writing. Um, all of these works are trying to present and make a certain type of case, that's very clear. So Tabari is making it a certain type of case which is about caliphal power, which is about how uh, caliphal power is uh, the rightful and continuous uh, continuation of prophetic power and prophetic authority. Um, the Shi um, works are again making a certain type of claim about the nature of sacred and political authority after the Prophet. So they're all making certain types of cases. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't really make sense to call one history and the other one purely rhetoric or propaganda. Now, then you have the revisionist turn, which particularly since the 1970s, uh, which was always about saying, well, look, we know the early Muslim sources are late, yeah. they are um, partial, they are biased. So perhaps we should look at non-Muslim sources. Um, not always rather honestly admitting that they're going to be biased in their own way. Of course, if you do look at the broad brushstrokes of that sort of revisionist um, history which is being written based on non-Muslim sources, that corroborates a certain imperial Islamic vision, particularly when some of those early sources are coming out of Syria. So they're basically accepting, in effect, Umayyad's uh, perspectives on early history. And within that, um, Imam Hussein Karbala barely gets a mention. In fact, in most cases, does not get a mention at all. Do you think that enough is being done um, in the field of Shi'i studies and by lovers of Ahl Bayt and Shias in general? Uh, to address the fact that uh, these writers that may be relatively influential, say, among university students or people who want to look a little bit deeper into Islam, so that they've got some influence, is, is enough being done to, to, to counter this um, and to raise awareness of, of the importance of Karbala, Imam Hussein's...? I mean, I, I think um, uh, Shi'i studies as a field is growing. And um, certainly 20, 30 years ago, there was hardly any work being done at all. Yeah. Um, now, it's tended to be, it tends to have been skewed in certain directions, you know, the study of law. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, the study of very particular hadith or looking at the formation of the tradition. Um, there hasn't really been much about um, she approaches to history as such. I mean, there are a few, there are a few studies here and there, uh, and certainly not ones which uh, I can I can think of maybe only one or two articles, which are specifically on uh, Karbala insofar as it's about the writing of history. Okay. So there's not actually that much work out there, and that's I think partly because of the the polemics surrounding the study of the early period. People tend to stay away from it. Um, right. If you are uh, a young academic, um, you could make your way in the early period if you're going to make a splash with certain sort of radical ideas. But on the whole, it's potentially more likely to bury the view than to make you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, sometimes people tend to be a bit reluctant. Um, even if you look at this, the field of Quranic studies, there are really not very many Muslims who are involved in that. Um, and I think that's 
at least one of the reasons why you get such wild um, kind of positions being put forward in, in Quranic studies. Just to come up to the end of the discussion, um, we've seen that the historical sources have, in a sense, portrayed the expansion of Islam from an Umayyad perspective, and they have marginalized um, what Imam Hussein salam, did, what happened at Karbala, that's been marginalized. And there have, in a sense, been produced versions of Islam that, that of course, non-Muslims, they don't understand what is the origin of these different versions of Islam. What would you say are the characteristics of the Umayyad take on Islam? And what are the characteristics of Husseini Islam? In terms of Umayyad Islam, it is basically imperial, legal, exoteric, even if you want to call it that, Islam as people know it. Yeah. It's all about the um, production and sustain, uh, sustenance of power. And it's about the law as a protection of particularly colorful central power and also of the public order. Mm -hmm. um, what then becomes Sunni Islam is fundamentally about protecting that public space, that public order in which the supremacy of the caliph's power is not questioned. So uh, broadly speaking, uh, pre-modern Sunni Islam is very uncomfortable with resistance. It's yeah. very uncomfortable with rebellion. It's very uncomfortable with anything beyond uh, a light kind of verbal disagreement with what um, those in authority are doing. And this is often um, uh, uh, sort of uh, defended and justified through recourse to Quranic verses which talk about um, rendering um, allegiance to those who are in authority. Yeah. Um, the whole notion of, of how authority is then justified through power becomes absolutely central. Now, what of course you have in the Shi conception and Imam Hussein kind of exemplifies that is that well, authority is authority regardless of power. Yeah. Um, the representatives of God are the representatives of God, whether they ha anyone takes any notice of them or not, whether anyone follows them or not, whether they wield power or not. Uh, you know, the, with the classic um, theological uh, formulation being that the Imam is the Imam, whether he is literally sitting or standing. Yeah. You know, so whether he has power or whether he is sitting in the mosque and just teaching his, his followers. So that's very clear. But also the principle of how you behave and deal with individuals. You know, that you deal with people with compassion. That's very important. Mm -hmm. You do not brutalize people. You do not, when, if you kill someone, you do not kind of mutilate their body. You do not behead them. You do not crucify them if you disagree with them. And in that case, what the Imam then represents is a continuation of what his grandfather represents and what his father represented, and that's very important. So what the Imam was then standing up for and how I think people afterwards see him is he is then defending the authentic legacy of the Prophet. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sajjad Rizvi, for a very detailed and interesting uh, discussion. This discussion has shown how specific perceptions of the purpose of Hussein ibn Ali's life may have influenced what we have available to us in terms of early hadith sources and narratives about his life. Histories of Hussein ibn Ali are also to be gleaned from different poetic forms and types of recitation, as well as details that mention his life in prose. Throughout this investigation on how the person of Hussein ibn Ali has been portrayed in the historical sources, it has been seen that it's very important for us to understand who has produced these historical texts, what were their motives for producing them, and what are the different forms and sources that we can learn from to put together a picture. It can be seen that politics, the social issues, social matters, economics, propaganda, all of these ingredients have gone in to how the person of Hussein ibn Ali has been portrayed. I would argue that there's still much work to be done in Western academia on coming to understand who Hussein ibn Ali was
and what his philosophy was and his reasons for taking the stand that he did.